Good evening, everybody. Happy Saturday. <clears throat> I hope that you haven't had to spend it um, outside in the rain as I've had to do this morning. It was quite quite hectic doing the decanting and getting everything ready for you all today. So um, I'm delighted to be able to do this set again today, having had the benefit of last night seeing most of these wines one time already. I actually think that I might be able to lend a little bit more insight tonight uh, to what uh, what you're going to be tasting. In terms of blind events, I usually preface it by saying two two major things. The first thing that there's no rules. Um, uh, whatever you like the most is actually the best wine for you on the night. Uh, don't ever feel like uh, there's any kind of expectation. If you have any any kind of opinions to to make, please throw them in. Any questions at any time, more than happy to to talk to everybody about what we're doing. Um, the second thing is the way I like to approach doing these sort of blind evaluations is to focus initially on the phenolics, how the wines are presenting on the nose. Uh, my, one of my main reasons for doing that is they suggest that about 80% of your taste is actually a function of what you smell. So it's a really good opportunity to kick off um, just having a nose of all these five wines um, and to give you a little bit of background uh, to what you might be smelling. So if you have all five glasses in front of you, I see that Nordstrom's still getting organized there. <laughs> so I'll, I'll just I'll just talk you through, if you want to have a, a sniff of, um, of all five of the wines, the one thing that um, I think you'll be able to note straight away if you smell one through the five, there's two wines here that definitely show uh, a nuance or a gentleness on the nose. Um, and if you can identify those two, you're going a long way to starting to eliminate the various, the various uh, criteria and categories. I think that what I took from last night tasting the Lewin, uh, I think the most important attribute that I picked up last night from the Lewin is a quiet elegance about the wine. Everything's nuanced. Um, everything's in its place, it's tidy, it's sleek, nothing stands out uh, one way or another. And for that reason, you might taste the Lewin tonight in the context of saying, oh, that wine's not really performing that well, but it's actually incredibly compact and tight at this, at this early stage. And in fact, what's super interesting is the nose on the Lewin is going is to be very close to the nose of the Chablis for very different reasons. Chablis, of course, is non-oak Chardonnay. The Lewin is well oaked, but at this early stage of a wine as magnificent, magnificently structured as Lewin, it's still very, very compact and tight. So you might notice uh, one through to five, you might notice two of those showing that kind of quietness on the nose, not to be mistaken for a wine that's lacking any, any kind of flavor or anything like that. It's just at this stage, very, very quiet. I'm going to just jump in and give you some overviews on each of the five wineries, and then maybe we can start tasting in no particular order. So hopefully you'll, maybe you'll pick out some of the traces. There's two wines here tonight that could very easily be uh, explained in the context of Merceau. And the definition of Merceau the, the main tracer that you're going to find in Merceau whites, white burgundy, is crushed nuts. It's a, it's a, very, it's a very big part of um, the, the phenolic profile of, uh, of a Merceau style wine. Um, and these guys, you, you're going to find that in two of them. So let's just talk a little bit. Let's jump out in and talk about the Bindi, for example. So Bindi Courts 2017. I think over the years, the one thing that I've always been drawn to about Bindi is a sense of crunch and minerality about the wine. It's enduring for maybe 15 different vintages that I might have tasted over the years. That's the one thing that seems to be really consistent about Bindi. Now Mike Dillon mentions that Bindi 2017 is a classic expression coming from uh, uh, Victoria. It's one of his, what he views as one of his most classic vintages. Um, what I took from it last night is a very clear, clean line in terms of the phenolic structure, um, very pure in essence. 
Um, and on the nose, I also picked up quite a lot of uh, fruit blossom, uh, maybe peach blossom, cherry blossom, that kind of gentle floral nose uh, definitely showed through quite well. What else did we see about the styling? Yeah, that's about everything. Uh, yeah. Then moving on to Domain Test Toot. Now this is the this is a Grand Cru Burgundy. In other words, the very very highest level of white Burgundy possible. Um, and we we promote quite a lot of it because it's one of the more uh, price structured or more affordable. Uh, examples of very top shelf burgundy. Um, it's not, uh, doesn't seem like any oak. It's very much an, an, what we would, in the new world would talk about being an oak burgundy. What you're going to find on the nose for the, for the uh, testute is quite quiet again, a little bit like the Lewin on the nose, quite withdrawn on the nose, but you're going to pick up crushed seashells, ozone, the sort of fresh sea air is a very, very clear note, a uh, phenolic note for it. Um, then uh, maybe iodine, which plays into that whole sort of seaweed kind of notion. But for me, the biggest thing is a green citrus. So like lime, lime zest, those, those kind of phenolics on the nose come through really, really well. When we eventually get to taste the stuff, it has a crunch and a crispness about it. There's no oak on the palate and you'll pick it up pretty quickly when you, when you taste it. So the Wombat from Giant Steps, um, this is a Merceau st styled wine. There's a lot of the crushed hazelnuts on the nose, uh, cashews, that, that, that sort of structure. And there's a little bit of sulfur or, you know what a, um, an unstruck match smells like, you know, that, the match head. You're gonna pick that up really, really clearly when you have, when you have a nose of, of, of the Wombat. It has a certain fatness about it as well, an oiliness on the nose. Um, and that's definitely a tracer for Wombat. The interesting thing about that particular winery is it's the highest altitude vineyard in all of the Arrow Valley. So with that comes a very long, slow ripening, a gentler kind of ripeness of fruit. Um, and it's the latest addition to the Giant Steps portfolio. Um, notion of biscuity, uh, brioche kind of notes to it, and it's only one of two Chardonnays that you're going to taste tonight that really speak into that baked kind of, uh, you know, um, brioche or bread or bread crumbs, those kind of things which are often a, a major component of Chardonnays. It's not in the Lewin, you won't find it in the Lewin, or certainly we didn't last night. It's not in the Testoot, it's in the Wombat and the Elephant Hill, the New Zealand the New Zealand Chardonnay that you, that you get to taste. So talking about Elephant Hill, uh, a large operation, Hawke's Bay, it's on the same latitude as Margaret River. And that's the only thing that's similar in terms of the two wines. Elephant Hill is big and broad and round, very opulent. Uh, we, that, it definitely shows brown spice. There's a lot of that, that kind of action on the nose. Again, a kind of nod towards a Merceau style of Chardonnay in terms of quite a lot of nuts, crushed nuts, toasted almonds, et cetera, that, that, that come through on it. Uh, what else? Who have I forgotten? Ah, Lewin. So background to Lewin. Uh, it was discovered in 1972 by Robert Mondavi, who is one of, I guess, one of the, the most famous winemakers in the world, and certainly one of the top most recognized winemakers in Napa Valley. Uh, the first vines went in in 75 um, and uh, they then started production and have kept a really sensible production level all these years. Uh, they definitely are um, only vineyard, vineyard based in terms of their fruit. Um, the, going back to what I was saying earlier about the sense of quietness and um, um, reticence in the wine now. Um, you'll see a certain detailing on the nose. It's very, very clever and very, very integrated. And it, it, if you smell these wines, it's going to be one of the first wines that you smell and think, oh, that's, that's really well made, but I'm not sure what it is. That was certainly the, the very first reactions that we had last night on it. Lots of oak in the wine, but you're not seeing it at the moment, which again is an indication of 
um, a youthfulness. Uh, it's certainly one of the one of the one of the youngest in terms of expression that you're going to taste tonight. So let's drink some wine. Uh, may as well start with number one. The question about the clones, uh, Li Hao, I should have the answer for you, but I don't. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll, I'll get the information for you. Quite a lot of orange tonight. It's interesting it didn't show that last night. Um, definitely a fatness and a, and a broadness on the palate. Um, the length is quite good. It's a wine that's going to get bigger and more opulent as it warms up. And maybe you should talk about that a little bit now. Um, I've got to the stage where I like to decant Chardonnay, particularly the better ones. Um, I've even saw someone decanting Champagne the other day, other day, and I think that's probably a step too far for me anyway. Um, but certainly with, Chard with Chardonnay, it really helps. It's always so In Singapore, it's always so difficult to get this nexus between keeping your Chardonnay cold and it getting too warm the moment, in, the moment it's in the glass. So it's always a bit of a balancing act, and I'd suggest that as you drink through these wines, come back to this number one, because um, it's a little bit cold in my glass now, but as it warms up, it's gonna give you some more length um, on the palate. Deep concentration of fruit. Um, yeah, uh, a lot of concentration in, in the mid palate. For me, a little bit short in the back at the moment, but as it gets, as it gets warmer, it's gonna give more. I think that the key word with this wine is a concentration of flavor, but, a, but an elegance or a poise or a restraint in the wine, which is really quite gorgeous. I think that it's going to show, um, it, it definitely shows as a new world wine. It's going to show more and more of those uh, generous aspects as it ages. Is anybody at this stage interested in making a call on the Chablis? It's the only one that's unoaked, and you should, in theory, be able to make that call just on the basis of the nose. For me, the difference in the nose between the Chablis and the Luan is very, 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 very subtle. The Luan is showing green tropical fruits on the nose, and the, uh, the Chablis is showing yellow citrus on the nose, but very, very quietly. The Chablis texture is velvety and silky, certainly in the front palette, and it's the most impressive in the front palette of all the wines actually here tonight. No calls on the, on the old world? Come on, guys. None? All right, we'll keep going. So number two, without giving the game away too much, is one of the quieter wines. Um, yeah, uh, the Chablis, two or four, yeah, the Chablis is number two. Um, that's the domain test suit. So maybe let's drill down a little bit more into that, into that Chablis now. That ozone, uh, that sort of ocean breeze kind of thing on the nose is definitely clearly showing. There's um, a saltiness for me, and then lots of lemon, lots of citrus. The thing I really like about this wine, as it is right now, is it's at that really important time when, uh, when Chablis is starting to mature, so it's not just giving aromatics, it's actually giving fruit body as well as it moves into being a mature spectrum wine. And that's a really interesting time to be looking uh, at, at Chablis in that sort of year three to four, when it's kind of recovered from all this un-oak treatment and stainless steel treatment, and it's got its aromatics, but it's starting to, uh, starting to actually broaden out and get more luscious. For me, the texture, of, of age Chablis is often uh, something that I draw a line uh, akin to um, New World Semillon. It just gets that beautiful waxy oiliness um, in year three and four. And the, the trick with Chablis as good as this is 
that it retains those those personality traits of old world wine but has wonderful wonderful uh generosity of fruit as it gets older um, there's only seven areas in chablis that are recognized as grand cru um, and this uh, Grenouille area is the smallest of all the seven. Very, I don't have the number with me, but I don't think it's more than 18 producers have Grand Cru status uh, in, in that particular area. It's very, very tiny. So let's go on to number three. Any opinions on three? Would you put it in the top two or the bottom two of the of the wines? Top, yeah. Um, it's definitely showing so beautifully now. I'm not sure how long you guys have had it out of the fridge, but for me right now, it's at that perfect juncture of just being cool enough to be appreciated, but the the actual the actual aromatics and the body of the wine is coming out. For me, there's a poise about it now. The wine kind of has this height and structure to it. And the length, that sort of final flourish that you're looking for is slowly coming through as it's getting warmer now. The overall uh, feeling that I have from tasting the wine is tonight is it really is kind of just peeking behind the curtains in terms of what this wine can show. Um, there's, there's no doubt that there's plenty more to come as this wine ages and, 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 and betters. Yeah, Tara and Alex are saying top two as well. Ooh, I love number four. I have, I have, I try, it's a battle for me um, not to be too uh, subjective when I taste wine number four. It's one of my absolute favorites. Um, it's a, a style that um, takes a while to come around. Um, relatively expensive uh, wine in Australia. Um, and it's one that I took me ages to try to justify. And the real trick about wine number four is its age capacity. There's, it's, its acid structure is so very good that it actually has massive uh, longevity. I'd say 20 years potential at least in this. The white peaches are a big thing for me in this. They might even be yellow peach as well. Wonderful clarity, wonderful cleanness and finish about it. For me, right now, tonight, that and the Chablis are probably showing the best finish right now. It's not to say that the wine's gonna, not going to evolve, the other ones are going to change over time. But for me, these two are the most complete this evening at this temperature. It might change as we drink more through the night. The oak is definitely there. There's no question that it's oak treated. But what's really cool that I'm finding in, in this wine, particular, particularly tonight, is everything is uh, in balance and in form. You, you, you're well aware that you're tasting a full-bodied oak chardonnay, but it's so subtle against the, uh, the acids and the fruits that it all tends to be one kind of picture. Nothing, nothing stands out terribly much in the wine. One thing I'd say about the back end of that wine number four is I'm getting that um, struck match, that sort of lift match kind of thing, which is often a tracer for me of um, secondary French oak treatment. Um, it, it's something that I always seem to align with, with that kind of oak treatment. So second or third generation oak. I think if I have my homework correct, uh, with this wine, it's a mixture of new and, and, and secondary, 
um, and I think it's about 50% new and the rest secondary oak. It's not retract, it's not taking away at all from the freshness, um, the sort of really clear linearity of the wine. So then looking at number five, remember we were talking about Merceau earlier, that sort of crushed nut kind of component, minerality, et cetera. This is something that's a tracer in, in this wine, really highly rated. Um, and I think it's, it's another wine tonight that's possibly got more time to come through, more time before it starts paying off. I'm kind of off put a little bit by how sulfurous the nose actually is. The palate is much more pleasing than the nose. Um, the volume's turned down a little bit on the palate from what I remember last night, but it's, but its construct is there. There's probably, it speaks to, for me, more about dried fruit than fresh fruit uh, uh, on the palate. Maybe honey, um, dried lemon, uh, confit, those kind of, those kind of uh, notions, uh, and maybe some peaches, Yeah, there's a, there's a certain poise about it, and, I, and I'm, I'm glad to taste it twice because I really didn't love this last night. And um, in fact, I think when we did the votes last night, this is the wine that kind of ended up coming last by, by vote. Um, but I think that uh, it's showing a little better tonight. It's actually in kind of pole position, I think, tonight. But uh, you really do need to get away from that that notion of the, the smelliness on the nose. Maybe I'm seeing too much of it. Don't know how you guys feel about that. Yeah, it's actually back palette is okay, but it's 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 uh, it's not matching some of the others here tonight. So we kind of know where the Shabli is. Maybe at this point, let's take votes for uh, one through to five wine of the night for you guys. So maybe you just want to throw that down on the on the chat or just yell it out. Either way is fine. So what, Robert, what are we doing? Just voting for a favorite one? Just let me know, Menwin. Just let me know what your favorite wine is of the five. Oh uh, yeah. Just okay. one number. So number two. James is three. Sean is three. Tori, you can't get two votes. Oh, you can. There's two of you. All right. <laughs> I was about to call uh, take new uh, call American politics on you. Okay, uh, four of you. So James, are all four of uh, both of you voting for four? Okay. <laughs> all right. So James. Is Two by four, WK is three, one, okay. Anybody else? Super interesting because um, two and three tie for wine of the night. Um, it's, 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 it's quite interesting because if you pull those apart, uh, three, uh, anybody want to say, make the call on the loon, it's probably self-explanatory at this point. That three three is the Lewin. Um, I think where where it aligns with the Chablis so brilliantly is um, net two and three. Okay, so it's still pole position for one of the night. Where where it aligns so brilliantly is the global critics when they've been tasting Lewin, or this Lewin seventeen, are putting it with the very very best of global Chardonnay. They su they're suggesting that. Forget about talking about new world or old world or anything like that. They're saying it's actually one of the best representations of Chardonnay ever, um, which is a really good call. Oh, Dave, uh, there's some there's some late votes here. He's, this must have been the mail-ins. One, <laughs> three. 
<laughs> it still it it still keeps the voting tally uh, two and three in pole position for wins. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so I, I think that the reason, that, yeah, Lihao, I agree with you, it's closed and needs time. I think that the Shabli number two is giving much, much more now uh, up front than the Lewin is up front. But the DNA of the Lewin is fantastic. It's, you know, you kind of have to try to look behind how compact and tightly closed it is. That wine in five or six years time, I, I, I could only wish that I could take five dozen of each of these wines, put them away and look at them in two years, time, two years time with you guys, because there's no question that that loon is going to be off the charts in terms of that quietness is uh, in the loon is going to definitely evolve. And in fact, as it gets warmer, you're going to see more and more uh, expression out of it. It's kind of cool to see that that green fruit, uh, green tropical fruit. So maybe kiwi, uh, papaya, green melon, those kind of fruit con constructs in the Lewin are definitely a baseline flavor right now. It, it may change, but it's definitely a dominant flavor at the moment. A lot of people write about grapefruits, pink and, and yellow grapefruit in the wine right now. Um, Wife's asking what's number four. We, we'll get to that. <laughs> we can't have any more domestics tonight. The codlings are already going at each other. <laughs> um, where, what was I saying? All right, let's talk about wine number four. So um, it's Australian. It's Bindi Court, uh, 2017. So very much a cool climate region. And what part of the old school Chardonnay produces way before, in fact, it's a wine that's kind of eclipsed that whole process of Chardonnay going from full oak to unoaked to balanced oak. It, it, the, the, the fashion trends in Chardonnay change all the time. But for me, what I love about Bindi so much is it remains true to its, to its style for decades. Um, and you see, you're seeing it here. It's just, it's got a freshness, but it has, the architecture of the wine is so brilliantly structured. Yeah, New World Chardonnay grown in Burgundy. That's a brilliant way to describe it. Um, I think how it has that brilliant gravitas of form and, and structure. Um, it's quite, it, it, it's less regarded by consumers than it should. Uh, I think it's, uh, I prefer the Chardonnay to the Pinots at the moment. It's just where I am in terms of what I'm drinking from them. But I really adore the way, the way it's structured. And more importantly, the way that style has stayed that way all the way through. So wine number four, wine number five is the Wombat, the Giant Steps Wombat. And I would argue you're seeing a better representation of it tonight than, uh, than last night. It's actually drinking better. It's still by no means my favorite of the night, but uh, it's good. That, I can't get past that sulfur. I can't get past that, that sort of smelly, slightly chemically thing tonight. Uh, as to, there's a private question about as to um, whether that sulfur will disappear over time. I hope so. I've seen other wines where it does, where the baseline flavor profile just gets bigger and broader over time and will we'll, we'll actually balance that out. So by definition, we've got an actuary in the house tonight, so he'd probably know. By sheer elimination, wine number one is the Kiwi Chardonnay, uh, Elephant Hill. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot going on in that number five nose, but I, it's hard for me to actually drill down into that and look beyond that sulfur at the moment. Or maybe I'm being a little biased about it. I think what I, 18, yes, yeah, T, you're right. In fact, the, uh, the wine critics will also say that 18 is a higher rated vintage for, for Wombat. I think um, Giant Steps has largely managed to dodge the bullet 
of smoke tanks for the last couple of years. Deming, you like it, the nose. I'm just thinking of fire and brimstone. I don't know, I can't, I can't get past that flint. For me, the palette is actually, I really like it tonight. Um, the palette is actually kind of together and the length is good. It's something I always look for um, in, the, in the structure of the wines. It's interesting to consider reminds of Cumi River. Definitely, mate. I would say that Cumi, I looked at uh, the mates and the Huntington the other day, and I would say uh, of the 17s, I didn't have enough to do tonight. It would be super cool. And I might, because it's so easy to do these Zoom things, I might actually do that, all the best of New Zealand shards, and that would definitely be, be in one of them. I think that Elephant Hill probably is showing more generosity of fruits and more phenolic abundance than the Cumu did when I looked at them the other day. Cumu was still a little bit steely, a little bit quiet. Um, so, but certainly uh, the Salome from what you're having tonight is their very, very top Chardonnay. I think they've got four. Um, and uh, they've spent a lot of time and effort to contend with the very best uh, of, of New Zealand Chardonnay. I think the thing that pleases me the most about the Elephant Hill is that oiliness in the palate. It's kind of got this broad, luscious kind of generosity in the palate that I, that I really, really like. And I think over time, that's going to become a, a bigger player in the wine. James, what's your favorite of all the Cumus? Because there's the, I think there's four. There's high, Something here, uh, Huntington Hill. Mates Mate, 213. Which, sorry, what's that? Mates 213. Oh, okay. So hard to get here. There was a while, we, we discovered a parcel of that uh, a couple of years ago and sort of marked it up modestly, not really knowing what the market would think, and they just absolutely vanquished it in about 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> it's it's Janice's favorite. Oh, is it really? Oh, that's very cool. It's so interesting to, to know that because in Margaret River, Mosswood is definitely Jancis's uh, favorite label, certainly for Cabernet in Margaret River. So I didn't realize she was a big fan of Kimia. Yeah, she's been, she's been making it quite popular in the UK. Yeah, and that, no wonder we can't get any more. <laughs> you guys might have noticed um, a note that I sent out yesterday about uh, how things are changing with distribution uh, in top labels. And I'm just waiting to see which of the Kiwi labels start using French negotiants for global distribution instead of using the traditional uh, channels. We've already been shown Jim Barry, Omar, um, Wins, Redoc, et cetera, out of France instead of out of Australia. Uh, there's this real change happening with the traditional infrastructure of regional distribution and uh, the French have definitely won big on it. Um, we're going to be showing um, most of the Italian Super Tuscans that way, um, uh, a lot of South American wine, the very top end, Clo Apolta, uh, Senya, Almaviva, etc. It's much, much better pricing than what was traditionally available out of the secondary market. So, we have a separate database for that these days. So if you guys want to see those offers, uh, you'll notice something on the home page that's marketing it. I'm going back to that wombat to see if I can get behind the, the nose. Yeah, it's better. Definitely the texture on the wombat, the thing that, that's the big points for me on that. And I can see Maybe that's the thing that gave that Hugh and Hook and Suckling uh, gave such quid, uh, such notes to. So heading back to the lure, you guys were kind of pretty much on the money tonight with all of that. As the wine warms up, I'm getting more of that uh, grapefruit kind of thing that the, the, the critics speak about with it.
But for me, the thing that I'm hooking on with the grapefruit is more about the acidics, you know, that sort of zesty verb kind of taste of freshly cut grapefruit. That's the thing that I'm identifying in the Lewin. So a textural uh, acidic thing more than fruit uh, for what that's worth. Does anybody creamy shows the feels not creamy? Deming, I think that the wombat is probably the creamiest of everything tonight, number five. And then possibly the Elephant Hill. Um, but I agree with you, these wines are super young um, and there's n none of them are showing that in particular. Last night we did the Atana instead of the test tooth and that was all cream. It was, uh, was giving this kind of yogurty kind of nose, which doesn't sound good, but it, if you smelt it, you, you'd kind of pin it. It's kind of that, that berry with a bit of an acidic grab um, and definite, definite creaminess on the mid and back palates. Uh, but sadly, we don't have that. We don't have that tonight. So in terms of uh, similar Chardonnays that do show that, uh, that's Felix. Um, the Kevin John has that to a lesser degree. Um, what else? Some of the older South Australian Chardonnays. And then, of course, if you head into the Hunter, uh, Scarborough, which is all about cream and oak. It has, it's kind of their, well, for me anyway, it's always been their trademark, the oaky, creamy kind of component to it. <laughs> well, I think uh, the question somebody made asked me last night was, what are my favorite vintages of Lewin? And I would say that maybe 10 and 12 of recent vintages uh, were great. And then 87 for me was still the, the absolute bomb diggity in, in terms of style. It'd be interesting to ask the guys at Lewin how they rate the last sort of 10 or 15 years of vintages to see how they personally feel about it. But there's no questioning that this, the 17 Lewin is going to be looked back on as one of the best they've ever done. I mean, admittedly, there's nowhere to go after 99 points. It actually gives me anxiety. I, I don't know what, what you meant to do after that. I think the worst thing I ever did was, was sell a 100 pointer wine um, because I, I couldn't sell it the next year. It was, it, it's, it's kind of weird, but it's something that I'm not particularly enamored with selling a perfect one. Yeah, that burns still kind of quite steely, quite sort of flinty tonight. In fact, the, the Bindi is giving more uh, in terms of a, a, a warmer kind of note than the Lewin, which is quite, quite unusual. Uh, Manwin, I would say I'm a huge fan of the Kevin John. I'm a massive fan. In fact, I tried to get the KJ, KJ for, for this event and just Corona and you know, travel and shipping made it impossible because I actually think that if you were to put down really super seriously the, 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 the top Chardonnays of, of WA, it would have to be Kevin John versus Art Series versus maybe the Xanadu uh, yeah. Reserve, yeah. which is super good. And um, yeah, that's probably sort of one of my fallbacks. Uh, it 